Hey guys, I hope you're all doing well. It's your boy Rami over here. It's been a while. I miss you all. May God bless you. I hope everything is doing well. So guys, I'm going to react to a video today. It's called The Battle of Uhud by History March. Um, I already reacted to the Battle of Badr video over here, which was the very first battle that the Muslims were engaged in. This is the second battle that the Muslims were engaged in against the pagans. This time it was initiated by the pagans and they came to avenge the loss of the first war that they encountered. So they came with a much bigger army and um, they came to Mecca's, uh, Medina's doorstep, which is where the Prophet Muhammad lived, peace be upon him. And um, this was a very interesting battle. I read into this battle before watching this video and the amount of information behind it is crazy. Um, it really teaches you a lot of lessons. Know who your friends and enemies are. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, um, there was another gentleman in the city of Medina that was very envious of him. You see, this man was meant to be a king, a ruler of Medina. But when the Prophet came to Medina and took, you know, authority there, he became very resentful and very um, uh, jealous of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So uh, when the Prophet said, look, this army's come to our city, uh, we need to defend it. Who's, who's up to defend the city? Uh, this companion at the time said, yeah, I'm up for it. And um, eventually in the morning when they all kind of gathered, um, you know, for the day of fighting, um, this particular um, companion and 300 of his followers uh, basically turned back last minute and said, you know what? No, nah, we're not interested um, in engaging in this war with you. So the Muslims had 1,000 and then they lost 300 from this companion and his um, his. Um, the, the people that were following him. After that as well, um, there's another vital lesson in this story that I read, is that, you know, follow commands and follow instructions. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, assembled 50 archers on the hill. Um, and they had these archers here to prevent the cavalry attacks with horses. Okay. And he told them, no matter what happens, even if um, birds are pecking at our heads and we win the battle or we lose the battle. Do not move from this hill. You guys are protecting this hill and protecting us from cavalry attacking from the back. So when the, when the engagement battle began, the Muslims were getting the upper hand. But then what happened was um, when the, the pagan Meccans uh, fleed temporarily because it looked like they were losing... Instead of remaining stationed in their posts, um, some of the um, Muslim army decided to go and loot the camp instead. So they left their positions. It was very scattered. They had assumed they had won. And especially the archers that were specifically told not to move, about three quarters of them left their station and went for the war booty. And when this happened, there were still enemy um, horseback uh, riders nearby that witnessed this and they saw a perfect opening to come through and attack the remaining archers and then attack the rest of the Muslims from the back. And then by the time this had occurred, the rest of the army that had fleed had regathered and come back. And then they got the upper hand. There was so much confusion. And this was the... Um, the battle that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, got quite seriously injured at. And there was a big rumor that he had been killed in this battle. So guys, I'm sorry for the long introduction, but honestly, there's so many... If, when you read into the Battle of Uhud, you learn so many life lessons within it. So it's very interesting and unique. Anyways, let's get to the video, guys. Thank you for um, holding up. Uh, let's check it out. After the Prophet Muhammad's victory over the Krashi Meccans at the Battle of Badr, the Meccan leadership had been decimated with the execution of Amr ibn Hisham and the loss of many tribal leaders. The disastrous news came as a shock to Abu Sufyan, but the old chiefs were soon replaced by their inexperienced sons, leaving Sufyan the only Quraysh leader of notable stature to direct civil and military affairs within the city. The older leadership had been reluctant to use force against Muhammad. But with the devastating Meccan defeat at Badr, the mood in Mecca changed drastically. 
Many Meccans now believed Muhammad could only be dealt with by force, and within a month after Badr, a Meccan raiding party had been assembled of around 150 to 200 men under Abu Sufyan's personal command to undertake a raid against Medina. The Meccans now regarded Muhammad as their arch-enemy. In April 624, Abu Sufyan's raiders approached Medina. Following traditional Arab tactics, they made ready to attack in the early morning, switching from camels to horses. Details on the raid are scarce, but it seems that it turned into a minor skirmish, with only a few workers caught tending the fields, and two houses burned before the Meccan raiders withdrew. After some time, Muhammad gathered a response force and chased after the raiders. The entire affair is known derisively by Muslim chronicles as the Porridge Raid, since during their escape from Muhammad, the Meccans jettisoned some of their baggage, including several sacks of dried barley used for making porridge. Muhammad soon broke off his pursuit, having given chase mostly to save face and not to engage the Meccans. The following month, Muhammad sought to capitalize off his victory at Badr by assembling a force of up to 450 men and leading raids against two Bedouin tribes, the Katafan and the Beni Sulaim. While no large-scale fighting took place, Muhammad's strategy became clear. His aim was to strangle and isolate Mecca economically and politically by depriving it of its much-needed Bedouin allies for safe caravan passage. In late January 625, an army of 3,000 men and 200 horses made up of the Quraysh, an assembly of Bedouin client tribes and some Abyssinian mercenaries, marched out of Mecca toward Medina, determined to bring the war to Muhammad's doorstep. They took 12 days to reach the outskirts of Medina, with their route of march taking them west of the city, and then north where they camped at a place known as the Two Springs on an open plain at the foot of a rocky outcropping called Mount Uhud. Terrain had made the direct approach to Medina from the south impossible, since the city is situated on a lava plain about 10 miles wide and 10 miles long, surrounded on three sides by steep mountains. Medina could only be approached from the north over open ground, free of obstacles. The Meccan army went into camp just north of the foot of Mount Uhud, but their arrival was no secret, and Muhammad immediately dispatched Muslim scouts to maintain watch over the enemy army. He called for a general mobilization to meet the threat, and about a thousand men were mustered for duty. Muhammad knew he was greatly outnumbered. Additionally, giving battle on an open plain would relinquish the advantage to the Meccans. Worse, the Muslims had no cavalry, while the Meccans had 200 horsemen under the command of Khalid ibn al-Walid and Ikrama ibn Abu Jal, later to become two of the most famous Muslim generals in the early Islamic conquests. Muhammad assembled a war council to seek advice. As always, the Prophet was disposed to the defense and wanted to draw the enemy army into Medina itself in urban house-to-house -house fighting. In this argument, he was supported by Abdullah ibn Ubay, the chief of the Khazrai and an experienced warrior, who was also in favor of fighting it out in the streets. Their argument was sound. The palm groves, springs, walled gardens, and the fortified compounds with their towers made it difficult for the Meccans to bring their superior numbers to bear on the Muslims. The terrain and obstacles would break up any Meccan unit cohesion making them vulnerable to ambush and piecemeal engagements by the Muslims, defeating them in detail. Meccans also had no siege weaponry, so if the Muslims withdrew into their compounds and refused to give battle, the Meccan army, lacking any supply trains, would be forced to abandon their position after the crops in their field were all used up. However, a large crowd had gathered, some wanting to fight in the city, while many wanted to fight in the open. Muhammad finally decided on a pitched battle. 
He donned his armor and retrieved his weapons, and ordered the men to muster near the cul-de-sac at the foot of Mount Uhud. However, Ibn Ubay strongly opposed Muhammad's decision to offer battle in the open plain instead of engaging in urban combat in the streets of Medina. He withdrew his contingent of Khazrai tribesmen, about 300 men, a third of Muhammad's army, and rode back to Medina. The rest of the host pressed on to Mount Uhud. Upon the arrival of the Meccans, Muhammad ordered a skirmish line to be thrown out across the northern approaches and nightly patrols conducted to warn of enemy activity. Muhammad then surrounded himself with a bodyguard of 50 chosen men. With the withdrawal of Ibn Ubay's troops, Muhammad had only 700 troops on hand to combat the Meccans. Of these, only a hundred were equipped in male armor. Across the pending battlefield, the Meccan cavalry had deployed in a somewhat unorthodox manner. One troop contingent under the command of Ikrima ibn Abu Jal was deployed forward of the main Meccan infantry line and was likely intended to skirmish with the Muslim front line using their lances from horseback. The more serious threat to Muhammad's position was the second cavalry troop, probably larger, commanded by Khalid ibn al-Walid and deployed far to the right of the Meccan infantry line. His mission was to turn Muhammad's flank. The terrain to Muhammad's left was broken by palm groves and walled gardens, but this was insufficient to prevent a movement in formation by al-Walid's cavalry. To prevent the Meccan horsemen from turning his flank, Muhammad posted 50 archers on the I-9 hill, hereafter called the Hill of Arrows in Muslim Chronicles. Muhammad reviewed his troops on horseback and then moved them into position on the battlefield. Sources don't specify the exact time of the start of the Battle of Uhud on March 23, 625, but it can be assumed that it likely started in the late morning or early afternoon. The two lines of infantry drew closer to one another, and the battle began when a Meccan warrior stepped forward, challenging the Muslims to send forth a champion to come forth and meet him in individual combat. Ali rushed from the Muslim ranks, attacked the Meccan, and killed him with a single slash of his sword. A single chant of Allah Akbar rose from the Muslim ranks. The brother of the slain warrior rushed from the Meccan ranks to attack his brother's killer. Before he could reach Ali, the fierce Hamza stepped forward between them and cut the assailant down. Three more men from the Meccan line challenged Hamza one after another. All three met their deaths at the end of his blade. Excited by the vigorous single combats taking place before them, the Muslim ranks charged the Meccans engaging them in fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat. The wounded were slain without mercy. As the battle raged between the infantry, a Muslim soldier named Abu Dujana cut his way through the enemy ranks before reaching the Meccan camp. He then scattered the Meccan female camp followers as he rushed headlong into the encampment. Meanwhile, Hamza seems to not have taken part in the charge, but prowled the battlefield looking for Meccan warriors to fight. Little did he know that Washi, a hired slave mercenary, was also looking for him. He was hired by Hind, the daughter of Utaba ibn Rabia, who had been killed by Hamza in the Battle of Badr, and now she wanted revenge. As Hamza engaged another Meccan champion, Washi found him, threw his javelin, and pierced right through his body. Hamza charged Washi, but before he could reach him, he collapsed to the ground. Washi retrieved his javelin and proceeded to walk off the battlefield, having no further business there. The ferocity of the Muslim attack succeeded in breaking the Meccan line at several points, permitting groups of Muslim soldiers to penetrate and begin isolating segments of the Meccan ranks, hacking them to pieces. For a while, their superior numbers allowed the Meccans to hold on to their position. Eventually, however, they began to waver and fall back in a semi-disciplined fashion. It was at this point 
that the Muslims pressed the attack with great force and ferocity, penetrating through the Meccan ranks until the enemy was cut off from their camp. With Muslim soldiers behind them and in the midst of their ranks, the Meccan defense collapsed. Once more, Muhammad's disciplined infantry had proven that a smaller, highly motivated force could defeat a larger, less motivated force in close combat. Had the Muslims even had a small cavalry contingent with which to pursue and scatter the routed Meccans, the Battle of Uhud would have been a complete disaster for the enemy army. But the Meccan cavalry, commanded by Khalid ibn al-Walid, had still not engaged in the fighting. Khalid hovered near the flanks, moving his mounted contingent about, and waiting for the right time to strike. It was at this time that the Meccan infantry broke and fled, exposing their camp. The Muslim attack subsequently lost momentum as the soldiers abandoned the fight to plunder the camp. Many of the archers guarding the Hill of Arrows also joined in the looting, with only a handful remaining at their post. Al-Walid, seeing most of the archers leaving to plunder the Meccan camp, rallied his cavalry and led it at full gallop through the now unprotected gap. Khalid led the horsemen from the front as they turned Muhammad's flank and struck his forces in the rear. 200 Meccan cavalry punched right through the enemy infantry and continued riding, readying themselves to wheel about and strike again. Attempting to regroup along the line of departure, the Muslims broke off their looting and turned around. This provided breathing room for the Meccans to reform and return the attack. Khalid ibn al-Walid continued to wreak havoc behind the Muslim positions, his horsemen riding about the rear striking targets of opportunity with their long lances. The Muslim infantry began to lose its cohesion and flee, with their formations collapsing entirely. Events went from bad to worse. Muhammad and his bodyguard were now surrounded by Meccan troops pressing the attack with great force. As the din of combat swirled around the Prophet, he was struck in the face with a sling stone that shattered one of his teeth and cut his lip and cheek, and received a sword blow on his helmet, the force of the impact knocking him off his feet. Around him, his bodyguards were being cut to pieces. The Meccans closed in on Muhammad's position. Seeing this, the Prophet's standard bearer, Mu'zab ibn Umayyah, raised his flag and shouted the takbir to divert the enemy's attention to himself. Mu'zab fought valiantly, but was cut down. Suddenly the rumor swept the battlefield that Muhammad had been killed. A cheer rose among the Meccans, but they mistook Mu'zab for Muhammad, both of whom wore similar battle armor. News of the Prophet's death brought the Battle of Uhud to an end, with the Meccans breaking off their attack in celebration. Meanwhile, Muhammad, dazed from the blow he received, was safe under a pile of bodies protected by a few stalwart Muslim warriors. Muhammad and his followers later buried their dead on the battlefield and returned to Medina that night. The Battle of Uhud may have seemed like a major defeat for Muhammad's Muslim army, but Abu Sufyan's Meccan army failed to follow up the scattering of Muslim forces and take Medina. He soon had the Meccan army riding home, believing they had won and that Muhammad was dead. Two days after the battle, Muhammad ordered the remnants of his army to assemble back at Medina. The Battle of Uhud was a setback for the Muslim cause, but Muhammad had not been killed, and Medina had survived. He and his men lived to fight another day. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget. Um, amazingly presented, amazing video. I love watching these videos because I used to play Age of Empires, guys, and I know war is not a game, like, war is very serious, but it's very interesting just to see uh, the tactics behind war. Um, you know, what people do to get the upper hand in a situation where they're battling out what, whatever it's for, whether it's for land, whether it's for, you know, whatever reason people are fighting for. But to see 
the tactics and the strategy behind it um, is amazing. It's very amazing. So as you can see, that was a defeat for the Muslim army. And as mentioned, there are many reasons for that. And uh, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from that um, battle as well. So um, amazing video, guys. Thanks so much for um, you know joining me on this. I hope you're all doing well. Um, uh, take care of yourselves, and I'll speak to you very soon. Peace.